Dr. Chevrolet Oldsmobile in Surrey or Town Center Leasing, 1130 West Georgia. Our free safety inspection may only save your life once. Excuse me. Uh, how can I help uh, you? You're the Shoppers Drug Mart farm. You're gonna be happy. Happy to help you. Shoppers Drug Mart. Good morning, I'm Pamela Wallen, sitting in for my friend and colleague Jack Webster. Jack, if you're watching, our hearts and our thoughts are with you this morning. We are going to have a great program today. It is fun to be back in British Columbia. I got to leave my winter boots in Ottawa. There's no snow, beautiful weather. A lot of issues on the program this morning. We're going to start off by taking a look at what's going on inside the Kremlin. President Chernenko arrived, uh, became public for the first time in two months on Sunday. He showed up at this meeting. You're watching it right now presented with uh, flowers. It was election of the Russian parliament. This is a highly edited two-minute version which was broadcast on Soviet television. There is a man who many consider a likely successor, Mikhail Gorbachev, posing for the cameras, recently gained fame by going to Britain to meet with uh, the Prime Minister there, Margaret Thatcher. In just a few moments, we're going to be talking with a columnist, a syndicated columnist for the province, Ilya Gerol. He is also a man who used to live inside the Soviet Union, so he knows what's going on. We'll talk about leadership and some other issues there. Also, I assume that you know already that the Canadian dollar took another plunge this morning. That means interest rates will be going up. This morning we're going to be taking a look at the economy, what's going on. We're going to talk with a key businessman, John Bullock. He flew all the way to Vancouver to meet with the Minister of Small Business to consult with the government about what Ottawa should be doing. So we'll find out what his ideas are. And later on in the program, a sensitive and a troubling topic. The topic of domestic violence. You'll meet a man that has some new ideas on what to do with wife beaters and their victims. All that this morning. We'll be back in just a moment to take a look at what's going on inside the Kremlin. Soviet President Konstantin Chernenko made a public appearance this weekend, proving that reports of his demise were just a tad premature. This morning we're going to take a look at what's going on inside the Kremlin and some of the other issues that the superpowers are dealing with, like Star Wars. Our guest this morning is a familiar face to many of you, Ilya Gerol. He is a Soviet defector, but you probably know him best because he is a foreign columnist on foreign matters, that is, for the uh, Vancouver province. You are not actually a defector, are you? You no, were I'm kicked not. out of the Soviet no, I'm not, Union. Yes, I was kicked out. Which well, is better. Which is better. Let's take a look then at this leadership question. We saw uh, Konstantin Chernenko for the first time in two months. He uh, comes to this meeting on the weekend. People are giving him flowers. He is making a public appearance. Is he alive and well? Is he going to hang in there? Well, uh, it is a big exaggeration that he comes. He doesn't come. He is brought. Mm -hmm. And I really doubt, looking in his face, whether he realized where he was. Uh, Chernenko, uh, his really health is really in very deep decay. And uh, the room where he was, mm -hmm. shown in 92 seconds <laughs> of this highly ed heavily edited uh, clipping, uh, the room, it is a hospital room. It is not a traditional place, traditional that polling station. That was a station. hospital room? It was a hospital room. It was a room with Kremlin Hospital. The real polling station of Bauman District, where uh, the Secretary General usually votes, uh, is totally different. Here was only basic equipment. Mm -hmm. um, one should know Russian polling stations. In Russian votes, elections, it is not elections really, but it's a big event, political event. Well, so every detail is really specially picked up and so on. Uh, here was very basic equipment. Mm -hmm. It is a show for TV uh, just to show that he is alive. But what's the message? Why do they want to prove very that he's good alive? Very good that you ask it. The message is important. It is not a message sent by the Politburo. It is a message sent by the group in Politburo. And the representative of this group was accompanying Chernenko in this room. It was Viktor Grishin. Uh, and unlike the majority of Western analysts, I still am not in a big rush to crown Gorbachev 
as we are doing in the West. We are already crowning him, we already appointed him the heir apparent, we already uh, pronounced him an next secretary general. Mm -hmm. I suppose we are doing great mistake again and again and again. All right, what are you saying then? Because this other fellow was there with uh, Chernenko at his side, that he's the most likely successor? Well, I would say the other fellow is not just a fellow. He is a head of Moscow Party organization, mm -hmm. and he could become a compromise figure between the septuagenarians, the deep septuagenarians, <laughs> the old, like old Gromyko, like Tikhonov Prime Minister, mm -hmm. who is 79, um, like Solomonsev, and are the old gentleman, Gromyko is 75. He is only 71, uh, Grishin, and he had only two heart attacks. <laughs> so really- So you're saying he's a young contender? Sure, as one friend in Moscow told me, if you keep him warm for two and a half years, he still can rule. Okay, n never mind the people, the, the personalities involved. What does it mean politically? It's are we going to get another lot. old guard or are we going to get a new guard? There is no new guard now. It, it means a lot. This is not just clash of personalities. Generally, mm -hmm. the Kremlin is never was a place where personality, clash of personalities was just carrying out for the sake of cl clash. Mm. Uh, it represents certain views, not so much political views. For example, uh, this old guard, so-called septuagenarians, octogenarians almost already, they have only one ideology today. No changes. They call stagnation stability. They don't say stagnation, we are stagnating, we are rotting, we, we are stabilizing, we need st stabilization, stability. What they, do they mean when they say stability? They want to die in their beds, mm -hmm. they want to die as a members of Politburo, to be buried in the Kremlin wall and to have some cities renamed after them. That's all. The new generation, which is very young by Soviet standards, and Romanov is 63. And that one. Sure, Romanov mm -hmm. is 63, which he's a kid and uh, by Kremlin standards. Uh, Gorbachev is 53, he's right. a grandchild, uh, according to the Kremlin standards. These people will come to power with certain ideas. Mm -hmm. They will change a lot. And first, uh, what they will do, they will throw out the old guard as really an uh, obstacle to their uh, reforms. The old guard understands it. I suppose that the old guard is still, still has an ability to, for two, three years to keep a person like Grishin mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on Chernenko place. I suppose the Chernenko fate is already clear. That's he sealed. will join Karl Marx uh, very, very soon. All right, now if, if the old guard stays in place, as you're suggesting that there will be no young pup put into uh, to office, what does that do on issues like the arms control talks that are going on? Is it going to make a difference? It will make a difference if it will be. I will say that Gorbachev or Romanov still have a chance. 60, 60, 70 percent chance against 30 of Grishin. But as usually in Russia, this 30 win. <laughs> but uh, if the old guard stays, then I suppose stalemate will continue. There will be no any decisions because the basic idea of this generation is not to change anything. As Brezhnev said once, that if Stalin proved that you can govern with a heavy hand, and Khrushchev proved that you can govern with a uh, kind of humanistic approach, Brezhnev proved that you c can avoid governing at all. But what are they going to so, do on an issue like Star Wars? Where are they? What can they do? Do they have the money to play? I think Star Wars is a very important issue. I wouldn't call generally it Star Wars. It's uh, Western media gave this very strange name to very important strategic defense, space mm -hmm, strategic mm -hmm. defense system. The Russians work over this defense system already for seven years. They already built a system of anti-satellite satellites. Uh, and we still believe that we impose on them the Star Wars system. It is them who, by the way, started to produce the system. And the Americans responded and to And the them. Americans are responding, of course, in very American way. It means a lot of noise, a lot of announcements, um, a lot of uh, discussions. And of course, a lot of immediate, prov it provoked peace movement, which really needed target because uh, missiles were deployed in Europe, uh, military balance between West and East is almost regained, so the poor peace movement was without a target, so they got the Star Wars thing out. But generally, uh, defense system, space defense system, mm -hmm. will change the whole perception about dealing between the superpowers. And we must not forget that both superpowers are moving towards it. Mm -hmm. Whether it will be a positive aspect, of, for example, to bring competition in the space and leave the Earth without nuclear weapon, 
idealist, in, in ideal, it could be really better to have it change. up there than down here. Sure. Uh, maybe it will not take place at all because nobody even can foresee the technological progress in, mm -hmm. the th in 30 years. But the main mis mistake of the West is to think that we will impose on Russians this competition and financially they will fail. They will not because the, uh, the Russians have very good way to get money for everything. They cut food supply again they will cut it twice until people will stop eating which they stopped already twice in Soviet history. So we shouldn't be naive about that. We shouldn't be naive about that. The socialism has ability to concentrate mm -hmm. spendings and efforts on something one. Living oh. standard that is not bothered. Uh, they right. don't bother uh, Those themselves. are a lot of interesting questions about the leadership and about the question of uh, what will go on between the two superpowers when they meet next month to talk about these issues like Star Wars about defense and space. We're going to invite you now to go to your telephones, give us a call. If you have any questions for our guest, Ilya Gerol, he is a man who once lived in the Soviet Union, now lives in Canada, makes his living these days as a columnist for the Vancouver province. We'll hear from you in just a moment. This is the Webster Show, and this morning we're talking about what's going on inside the Kremlin. What difference will a new leadership make and relations between the superpowers? All those questions. Our guest is Ilya Gerol. He is a syndicated columnist and a columnist for the Vancouver province. We're going to be taking your calls right now. We'll go ahead. Go ahead with your question for Ilya, please. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Gerol. Good uh, morning. Uh, first off, I'd like, I'd like to comment that uh, I think Vancouver is very fortunate to have uh, a man of your... Uh, abilities as far as uh, analyzing the east-west situation in our midst here and I, I have read your column consistently with great interest over a long period um, and it's in this long period it's in this uh, I, I wonder what is happening with in terms of the Soviet Union are they going to be moving away from uh, a confrontational attitude in the in the in the time in the in the near time frame or will Will this attitude of confrontation still exist uh, over a period? All right, mm -hmm. let's it, hear from Mr. Gerald. It's a very good question. If the changes are coming in Moscow, that means if this new generation will come to power, whether it will be Grigory Romanov or uh, Mikhail Suslov, it will be step by step, not overnight, but step by step, a new approach worked out, a new approach to. Uh, this, the relations between superpowers and the blocks, military blocks. For the reforms, the Russians will need time. And time for very deep reforms, not cardinal reforms like in China, but certain deep economic reforms, particularly in agriculture. Uh, they will need time. And this time can be bought only by softening the atmosphere by introducing certain elements of thaw. They will not try again detente because detente proved unworkable for, for both sides. For the West it meant in fact military defeat and for the East it meant ideological subversion because detente brought the Western cultural influence in Russia which by people like Chernenko was considered really uh, very damaging. But ones. how much time are you talking about? I'm talking about two, three, four years. Okay. Those who expect that we will forever be friends and brothers with Moscow, uh, they of course are under illusions. But I suppose that the new leadership will come to terms with the West, in fact that we coexist on one planet. And as much as our ideological differences still are and will be forever, we shouldn't really use tanks. All right, let's take another call right now. Go ahead. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. That's good. I was in Russia in 79 at a hang gliding competitional meet. And the general attitude I received from the majority of the people that I saw, other than our chauffeurs, as we were told they were, um, was very gloomy and, and much of a down mood. I don't know if it was my imagination or not, but was that the general attitude, or am I just seeing the wrong half? I suppose uh, you are very observant, sir. Uh, it's really, majority of Western tourists usually notice only the amount of caviar they receive in special <laughs> restaurants for foreigners. Uh, you noticed the reaction of the average people, and that's really very gloomy. Starting from 1978, the year when Brezhnev as health practically deprived him on possibility to govern. Detente was broken 
uh, Afghanistan started, food disappeared from the stores, uh, the future was bleak and is bleak, and food shortages really became so acute that mood was gloom and is gloomier and gloomier now. So that's a true picture. That's what we have, these gray, dark streets of people huddled in their fur coats, walking along, looking exactly. like they've just lost their last friend. Exactly. And the only way to avoid this uh, impression is to send our peace activists or some progressive religious activist uh, directly to the restaurant for foreigners. They usually have mm -hmm. very good impression after that. So you get a colored view. Yes, when once I heard Graham, um, Billy Graham mm -hmm. uh, said in Moscow that he never ate so much caviar in his <laughs> life, and that was his best impression of Russia, right. I mentioned that he ate all my caviar because I haven't eaten caviar in Russia for 10 years, right. like none of the Russians. All right, we'll take another call. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. How are you? We're, we're well. Fantastic. Uh, I just spent two and a half months in Russia, uh, just coming back about uh, middle of August. And um, the thing I found uh, that, that I was probably the most, frightened, most shocking to me was that the American press that have a tendency of painting the KGB as a very controlled organization that controls the people within the state, um, that the people are afraid of the KGB. What I found was rather humorous that the lack of respect for the average KGB person uh, we were taking a taxi one place, and uh, we had a, quite an argument. The KGB officer came over, and the taxi cab driver showed absolutely no respect for his position or anything else. And I found that kind of humorous, because the picture we, we are, are led to believe is that this powerful organization is controlling the minds and thoughts of all individuals. All right, let's hear about I, that, about very the good. KGB. I suppose you uh, noticed very interesting part of life of every totalitarian state. People who lived in Nazi Germany would tell you the same. Uh, there is no real obsessional fear for KGB because everybody who is arrested is already arrested. Uh, but other people, they really have no fear. It is something which people who were in jail for political reasons can understand. You laugh a lot. Generally, it is not fearful anymore. It is funny. Although, uh, you mixed up a bit uh, militia and KGB. When you were attacked, the officer who came to you was a militia officer. Nobody cares about militia in Russia whatsoever. KGB is a bit different. People used to joke about KGB until KGB appears. Can you tell the KGB when you meet them on the street? Oh, yeah. It is something which you can read on their forehead, I suppose. Um, however, I suppose even in every country when you see secret police, you can recognize them. I they usually have the same, um, the same expression. I wouldn't think those guys would be a joke. They're the ones that can send you off to Siberia. Uh, they can't. It's not so easy in Russia. Uh, they can arrest you, they can uh, talk to you, they can deprive you of work, mm -hmm. they can deprive you of receiving apartment, right. for example. And the main thing in Russia is to receive apartment once in 20 years. So they have a lot of other things. Siberia, it's already, uh, it's very top. All right, we've got a couple Thanks. more calls here. Let's hear from you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, good, e uh, good afternoon. Good morning, good morning. I should say, uh, <laughs> Mr. Garo. Good morning. Yes, I want to say also that the lady there is doing a very good job. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, Ilya, I must say I'm a great fan of yours. I've read every column you people put out. In fact, I have a little file. I clipped them and saved them. <laughs> now, thank I have you, a sir. question for you, which I believe uh, was kind of a long-term question. Do you feel our system in the long term can really survive the Soviet system, or do you feel we're going to slowly, do you believe in, in history, say 100 years from now, our system is going to fail, or do you believe we will triumph over the Soviet system? Well, now is exactly five years I am in Canada. And those of you who read my articles and watch me on TV from the beginning, you maybe remember that I started right here with Jack Webster once when, mm -hmm. on TV when I was here. And five years ago, speaking here on Jack Webster's show, I was very pessimistic as far as our future is concerned. Today, I am really optimistic. I think that President Kennedy was right in his speech, which he never made. Be the speech was, uh, was written before, shortly before he was killed, that in the long run, democracies appear to be stronger than totalitarian regimes. Although in short run, uh, in short period of time, totalitarian regime seems to be stronger because they're more aggressive, more consolidated. In long run, they are losing. And you know, I was in Grenada <coughs> during the American operation. I saw 100,000 people in the streets. It is 95% of the whole population of Grenada are crying and, and repeating one only words, don't leave us alone. 
they had four years of communism. It was more than enough. Uh, so I suppose that sooner or later, the, demo the democracy, as weak as it is, as imperfect as it is, as unfair sometimes as it is, sooner or later it takes over. Ilya, we're going to take a short break here. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. More calls from you, we hope, on what's going on inside the Soviet Union. Test one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. He's not going to shout, for God's sake. You want me to? I, I got to put the phone down for a second. Is there? I have to turn it down. Just hang on. I have to move the phone. I have to do everything. It's not easy. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, nine, four, three, two. Hello? Our guest on the Webster Show this morning is Ilya Gerol. He is a columnist. He is a man who spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union, understands that system, and this morning we're talking about that. What goes on inside the Soviet Union, and how is their system different from our system? Will ours survive? Will theirs survive? Those kinds of questions. People have been phoning in. Our phones are lit up. We'll go now to a caller right away. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah, my question is, is the Soviets having a tougher time economically? And if so, do you think maybe the States is... Uh, encouraging, in a way, the arms race on purpose for maybe economic uh, chaos or economic collapse. All right, go ahead. We were talking about that before. Can, can the Soviets really afford economically to play the, the uh, game? The answer is yes, they can. And they can afford it better than the West can. Because in the West, you can't diminish the living standard uh, without really big problems during the next elections. In the USSR, where the last elections were in 1917, uh, which means almost 70 years ago, uh, being re-elected is really not a problem. <clears throat> so you sacrifice everything in Russia, but arms race is preserved. <clears throat> and that's why uh, there is no really serious reasons to believe that the West provokes arms race to destroy Russia economically. The West destroys economically itself much more than Russia, if so, but the West doesn't do it. Uh, Russia is ahead in arms race. Russia has military superiority in conventional weapon at least three to one. And in nuclear weapon and in missiles let, and in the space. Let me interrupt you now. just for a moment. How do you know they're ahead three to one? We have statistic, uh, statistic which is o o open. I just recently returned from NATO headquarters mm -hmm. where I saw maneuvers of um, NATO troops, observed manu the maneuvers of NATO troops and went deep into statistics, which uh, is not a secret statistic. And we know that if we take tanks, we know that 42,000 Soviet tanks in Europe are confronting 12,000 NATO tanks. It's much more than three to one. Uh, so um, I suppose it is not a big secret, and it's clear. It is recognized by both sides. And that's why the West, the NATO now, is trying to catch up but that's as far as conventional weapons are concerned. Conventional. What about the, the nuclear side? About the nuclear side, as far as, uh, nuclear, as, far as planes are concerned, uh, bombarding planes, mm -hmm. uh, we are ahead. As far as missiles are concerned, Russians are ahead almost two to one. They've got more missiles. They have much more missiles. All right, let's take another call now. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, first about, about the... Uh, situation in Poland, if that would be likely to change after with a change in leadership. And also, I'd like to ask if he, if Mr. Gerald thinks that given the situation in the USSR, the way their economy is run, if they have as much of a vested interest in maintaining the arms race as the corporations in the uh, United States have. Oh, whoops, sorry, I just, I just didn't mean to cut you off there, but that's an interesting question because we're hearing it even in Canada right now, which is more money, more spending on defense is going to create jobs. We've certainly heard that from the President of the United States. Is that what they're saying well, inside Russia? Inside Russia, they don't say it because uh, jobs is not a problem. In Russia, is a problem uh, really where to find workers. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the system is, is, socialism is a system where everybody works having one-third of normal salary. So, in fact, work in Russia is a main a substitute for welfare. 
but uh, in the West is a bit different. Yes, I would agree that the military industry, unfortunately maybe, uh, provides not only jobs, but provides technolo technology development, creation of new branches of industry, mm -hmm. and indirect supply industry, and the whole complex, which really boosts the development. It's interesting uh, to note is that during Vietnam War, Korean War, and Second World War at the end, uh, in the West really, the technological revolution took place. Right. Uh, I suppose that um, we in Canada, when we try to avoid development of military industry, although in the 50s we were one of the best in the world, we try to avoid it, we give it to others. Today, Belgians, West Germans, Holland produces weapons which Canada produced um, relatively recently. I think that we should be pragmatists. We live in the time of confrontation between two blocks. We are part of the Western bloc. Why should we give away the opportunities to produce something which will boost our industry at the time when we need it desperately? All right, our caller was also asking about Poland. Poland. Uh, nothing will change in Poland because of changes in Moscow, but the changes in Poland already are taking place and they are maybe not noticeable, not visible enough, but we should mention them. Maybe you <coughs> noticed that yesterday the Polish government cancelled, abandoned its plans to increase food prices because not only the solidarity is threatened with a strike, but even communist, official communist state-run trade unions mm -hmm. did the same. It means that these official unions are in fact still together with the solidarity. And that means that Polish government will never gain overall victory and sooner or later Polish society solidarity on one side and unions other unions the government on another side will work out some kind of modus vivendi to build a society a type of Hungarian one socialism with almost humane face all right we'll take another call go ahead Mr. Garrow <coughs> yes sir yeah I want to uh, let you know that I read your column regularly as well thank you your, uh, and your new column, the Ask I hope you're going to get some more space in that pretty soon. We don't see too many letters. I hope too. Thank you. I wanted to ask you a question about civil defense in Moscow. And with the new leadership, with the younger leadership, is it going to be affected? Very good. Uh, I'm very glad that you asked this question. It's Thank you. Uh, civil defense in Russia. The development of civil defense in Russia was almost always a priority for the Soviet government. When I was in school, our first, in every Monday we were told that you have to go to a shelter, to bomb shelter under the school mm -hmm. in the new building, and you have to learn again and again how to use it. In universities, everywhere, every new building is with bomb shelter today. <clears throat> the bomb shelter is officially, I don't know how it will be in fact, it's, I hope never will be proved, uh, is um, good enough to survive even nuclear war, as official Soviet um, propaganda insists. But we should remember that civil defense in Russia is a priority. That means that they are really, they believe that you can survive nuclear war, at least you can try to survive nuclear war. The existence of civil defense in Russia should be understood by us, and I suppose should be either followed or we should start certain negotiations with the Russians to bring it on the more or less equal limit, as well as space defense, because the similarity in defense is really a way to prevent confrontation. All right, we'll take a short break here. Ilya Gerol will be back talking about life inside the Soviet Union. Our phones are lit up. We'll hear from you in just a moment when we come back. Sometimes those of us who live in the West are just a bit naive about what goes on inside the Soviet Union, and that never is truer than when we're talking about things like the arms race. We've had some interesting comments from our guest, Ilya Garol, this morning about how the Soviets are ahead on conventional terms, certainly in the uh, war buildup, the weapons buildup. We're going to take a look at that and the different societies, the different aspects of our societies, uh, and how they are going to be affecting arms talks between the two superpowers. A call now from Kelowna. Go ahead. Good morning, Pamela. Good morning, Mr. Good Giroir. morning. I read a very interesting article of yours written January the 9th, 1981, and this is quoted from it. The hypocrisy and incompetence of American foreign policy were never more obvious than in Cambodia. 
This gang of murderers, Pol Pot's communists, exists only because of the immoral support of the United States. I wonder what your comment on that is now. It's a quote from my article. I wrote <laughs> quite a good article. I never can, can write so good again, huh? <laughs> but in 1981. But uh, yes, I am uh, ready to subscribe uh, this thing again. Uh, Cambodia is one of examples of blindness of the United States foreign policy. Uh, after the defeat of Pol Pot, and Pol Pot generally came to power in many ways because of stupidity of American foreign policy in Indochina, uh, because Americans helped uh, to overthrow Prince Sihanouk, whom they support now, to bring a regime of Lon Nol, a uh, corrupt regime which was overthrown by uh, Khmer Rouge. Now when Vietnamese uh, occupied, of course, Cambodia and installed regime pro-Moscow, pro-Hanoi regime, bo regime which nevertheless reinstated some kind of life in Cambodia, life dis uh, destroyed by Pol Pot. Pol Pot killed half a population, uh, closed schools, closed hospitals, destroyed cities, so a new power came. It is not power which we would like to see, but nevertheless, it is power who helped people to rebuild their lives. The gang of murderers, one of the wor worst murderers in 20th century, Rouge, uh, Khmer Rouge, which are the leading force of so-called Democratic Kampuchea coalition, is supported by the United States vigorously. Uh, where are the results? The results are that militarily Khmer Rouge is crushed. Vietnamese troops are on the borders with, uh, with Thailand. Thailand could become the next victim. Uh, the loss of Thailand will mean really the loss of Southeast Asia. From point of view of morality, uh, from the point of view of the West's prestige for the United States and for Canada to support Pol Pot, to support so-called democratic Kampuchea is blindness. If we would recognize the regime, the communist regime, uh, in Phnom Penh today, we would be able to influence Vietnam more than we are influencing it now. Vietnam generally is annoyed with the cooperation with Russia. If we would approach Vietnam from that point of view, we could see another Chinese version of the behavior in Vietnam in five or ten years. And that would be much more pragmatic and more wise and more moral from point of view of morality uh, better if we would stop to support the murderers of Pol Pot. I'd, li I'd like to ask you a question there really at this point and you're talking about morality of some of these moves. We have President Reagan's taking some pretty stuff, uh, tough stands in Central America and just a couple of days ago saying he wasn't going to back down until he had Nicaragua saying uncle You've got, on the other hand, a situation like Afghanistan, and I don't mean to say that they're directly comparable. They're not comparable at all. Well, where do you draw the line between uh, regimes, whether they be uh, of President Reagan or President Chernenko, moving into to satellites, what they consider satellites? Well, let, us, let us be fair. President Reagan, Reagan's army, American army, is not in Nicaragua, and Russian army is in Afghanistan already mm -hmm. for five years. Mm -hmm. That is a basic thing. And we already say in Western media as if already Americans are five years in Nicaragua. Second. Well, they're paying the bills for the contras that are They're paying the bills for the contras and that they have to do. Mm -hmm. Because the contras are the people who try to overthrow the Sandinista government, the totalitarian government, which replaced the totalitarian regime of Samosa with a left-wing totalitarian regime. The Western world swallowed easily uh, the elimination and expulsion of 25,000 Indians of Mesquite tribe, for example, in Nicaragua, because the Mesquite tribe didn't want to support this line of Sandinistas. Our liberals swallowed it easily. Who cares about Indians of Mesquite? Mesquite, mm -hmm. if we have such incredible problems as 52 American advisors in El Salvador. Now, in Nicaragua, who are these Contras? These Contras are not former Samosa soldiers, as again, our leftists repeat and repeat. These are people who supported Sandinista movement from the very beginning. Some of them were leaders of Sandinista movement. Well, surely movement. it's some of both. I would not say so. According to survey, which was made recently, 75% of 15,000 Contras mm -hmm. were former Sandinistas. And half of their leaders were leaders of Sandinistas, like Pastora, for example. 
who was commander zero, who was one of the number one Sandinista leader. They want to have to bring Sandinista movement to the point where Sandinista movement was, democratic movement. Today, to support so-called Contras is to support the democracy in Nicaragua. If not, if Nicaragua will be totally under Moscow and Havana with troops there, which soon will take place, then the next is Mexico. And then I want to ask you what we will do having with Mexico 4,000 miles uncontrolled borders. So morally you think is justified. Okay, morally let's is hear from our, uh, our callers here from Aldergrove, long distance. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Carroll. Good morning. I follow the world military situation with great interest, as you obviously do. And uh, we've talked this morning about the disparity, obvious disparity in forces. But it's become apparent over the last three or four years that many of the Soviet troops are dissatisfied such as the mutiny aboard the destroyer in the Baltic, the situation in Afghanistan. And can you tell us your opinion of that and what these troops would think if they were fighting in West Germany? Thank you. I would like to be realistic. Uh, this uh, riot on the destroyer was um, 11 years ago. In my city of Riga, where I lived then, I knew some people who were connected with this. It was long ago. It was a time when democratic movement in Russia was on its peak. Generally, you are right, the Soviet troops appeared to be morally and ideologically not well prepared. Afghanistan has proved it. Although, there is a situation. For example, the military actions started in Europe, let us say. And this situation was really in NATO discussed quite seriously recently when I was there. Will the Russian allies be reliable or not? We used to say, well, Czechoslovakia will be not, Poland will be not, Germany will be reliable, yes. In fact, majority of psychologists and researchers believe all of them will be reliable if they will have success in the first 10 days. They would like then to have their share of, of the pie. If the success will not be there, the reliability will be much less. But generally, let us not hope that the Russians are so dissatisfied that they will not fight. Majority of uh, the Germans during Nazi Germany were really not the supporters of Nazis as we think from, from today. The majority were in fact against Hitler or at least neutral, but they fought like hell. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Ilya Geral, who is Thank a you. syndicated columnist. He is a foreign affairs analyst for the Vancouver province spends an awful lot of time studying what goes on inside the so Soviet Union. He used to live there. Thank you very much. Provoked a lot of calls. Enjoyed talking to you. We'll be back in just a moment with John Bullock. He is the president of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. He has just finished a meeting with the BC cabinet right now. He has some suggestions for them. He's on the line in Victoria and we'll be back in just a moment to talk to him. Don't go away. The news we've all been hearing for the last week is that the dollar is taking a dive and interest rates are going up. It's focused the attention of the Canadian people on the economy and what's going on. Of course, we're expecting a budget coming up in April or May, so there'll be some answers there. Ottawa and the federal government are busy consulting these days. They're out in British Columbia to talk to business leaders and to the B.C. cabinet. The uh, Minister of Small Business is uh, in Vancouver or in Victoria. Also, John Bullock is in Victoria. He is the president of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, an organization that always has something to say on any topic economic. Mr. Bullock has just emerged from a meeting with the British Columbia cabinet this morning and a bit later on today he's going to be meeting with Bill Bennett, but we've managed to catch him in Victoria before he goes to that meeting. Good morning, Mr. Bullock. Good morning, Pamela. How did your meeting go? What did you have to say to the uh, cabinet ministers this morning? Well, the meeting went very well. We've been meeting regularly with the cabinet for a number of years and they give us a very cordial uh, uh, invitation and uh, very good to us actually in terms of time. We've been discussing how to uh, diversify the BC economy, how to uh, encourage jobs through the creation of new small business ventures and uh, how to work with the federal government in uh, eliminating duplication of programs and getting more of the activity in the economy down at the local level. Well, realistically, Mr. Bullock, there's 15 percent unemployment in this province. What can you do tomorrow or next week to change that? You're not going to do anything uh, tomorrow or next week uh, because the BC economy is narrowly based around the resource sector and the demand for resources around the world is not what it was in the last 25 years. So 
there's a difficult long-term adjustment uh, required in British Columbia to uh, uh, diversify the province and uh, develop more jobs through brand new business ventures and uh, they can start to move in the right direction and uh, see results within a couple of years but there'll be no dramatic uh, turnaround. What kind of new business ventures Mr. Bullock? We've heard an awful lot since the Conservatives were elected in Ottawa about uh, having recovery be built around entrepreneurship in this country that uh, the private sector was going to be the engine of economic growth. What can you do? This is a mining, a resource-based province. What are you going to do differently? Well you're going to have to go into these narrow-based resource communities uh, and uh, uh, encourage uh, uh, the unemployed, uh, the people that are early retired to start uh, business ventures and provide services and products that uh, are not available at the present time. Uh, all development starts with uh, local import replacement and the provision of local services and BC has been a province where much of the activity has been centered around uh, mining and pulp and paper. That's going to be still important in the future but a big part of the future will be creating uh, uh, new types of uh, of companies providing s services and products that are presently uh, not available within the province. The lower dollar we've been hearing so much about in the last week or so, certainly that's good news for some of the, uh, the businesses in the province of British Columbia, the, those companies that export, and that has to do with mining and forestry. What about spa small businessmen like you? What do you think? Well, I don't think that uh, any economy benefits in the long term by a weak dollar. Uh, in the short term, you can get uh, advantages uh, on the export side, but eventually uh, you find your uh, inflation uh, moving upward and wage rates moving up, and eventually you neutralize the value of your lower dollar. In the long run, you only suffer with a weak dollar, but certainly in the short term, it will have specific uh, benefits to uh, the resource-based parts of the, the uh, country, especially in the West. But what about the people you represent? Well, they worry more about uh, the cost of, uh, of interest rates. At mm -hmm. the present time, the government uh, seems to be letting the dollar slide gradually, and the escalation interest rates has not been too severe. But uh, if there was a, a continued severe upward pressure on interest rates, there would be a lot of, uh, of negative uh, reaction in the small business community. We don't think we're going to see that. We think we have a very unusual phenomenon that may only last a few months uh, at the present time. I want to change the topic just a little bit and, and take you back to November, I think it was, of, of last year. And you weren't a very popular man for a couple of days. You said that there was 170,000 jobs across the country and people were basically just too lazy to go out and get them. You said there were 20,000 jobs available in British Columbia that nobody was taking. You've come back out here now. Have you had time to rethink that, change your mind? Well, of course, that was a result of a, of a, of a survey in the same way as you do a Gallup poll. You interview, you interview uh, uh, several thousand companies and, and, the, and the results are then extrapolated and what you get is a small business sector that doesn't operate through the traditional government channels, that doesn't use uh, employment centers, that doesn't uh, uh, put ads in, in daily newspapers in big cities and uh, there is and, and was uh, uh, a significant gap between the jobs that were available and not being filled and the unemployment rate and uh, we have uh, worked cooperatively with the Department of Employment and Immigration. We've uh, asked them to set up small business uh, personnel uh, in all the various regions of the country and and try to do a better job of uh, servicing the small business so the small businessmen will make uh, information on these jobs available to the employment centers and uh, uh, we'll probably have some results in a couple of months as to uh, whether or not that's really working. Okay, but, but my question is what do you think has gone on with, with those vacancies we were there? If there are 20,000 jobs available and we've still got 15% unemployed in, in the province of British Columbia, what's going on? Is that not well, been I can't tell until, unless we did another study. As I said, yeah. we, this was based on, on a sample uh, interviews across Canada mm -hmm. and, and they're extrapolated to the uh, population as a whole and, uh, and we broke out the reasons for these vacancies and, and made uh, the massive study available to the uh, Department of Employment and Immigration and all the provincial governments to see if they couldn't integrate better the, uh, the gaps between what employers were looking for and uh, the jobs that were uh, uh, the people that were looking for work. And all we can do is try to make the system more effective by giving accurate data on the kinds of uh, vacancies that are there and, uh, and the reasons why they're there and uh, hope the system can work better. We're not an employment uh, agency operating at every town and village in Canada. No, I understand that. You and your group have always been pretty uh, vociferous about the question of unemployment insurance too. You think the system's too loose, that too many people have access to it, that it costs too much money. 
and you don't really want to participate in it, you think small business gets a, a raw deal out of the unemployment insurance scheme. Well, you've got to compare, Pamela, between Canada and the United States. Uh, right. People should ask, why do the Americans have only 7% unemployed, and why do we have 11? Well, their labor markets are more flexible. People are on UI for six months, and they're mm -hmm. on UI for 12 months in Canada. Uh, over the last 10 years, Americans took average, took, uh, average pay cuts of 10%. And uh, in the last two years, 33 million Americans changed jobs out of 80 million workers. The economy is uh, flexible and adaptable, and because people are moving and training on the job and, and taking uh, wage cuts as they move into totally different kinds of work, uh, more people are being put to work, and they don't have the unemployment. But we have a more rigid economy in Canada, and unemployment insurance is one of the factors that makes our economy more rigid than the American economy. But realistically, Mr. Bullock, you've also been sitting here telling us this morning that in an economy like British Columbia's, it's dependent on resources it's going to take some long-term planning. There's going to have to be a lot of changes. It's going to take a few years to accommodate that. What do you do with the 15% unemployed? Kick them off the UI rolls? No, you don't. You have to move in a number of areas simultaneously. You don't get effective uh, uh, dynamics uh, uh, taking place in, in, in the small business community unless you move in a dozen areas altogether. We have massive problems uh, facing our small business sector. We are creating as many brand new companies as the Americans, but our small firms aren't growing as big as the Americans because there isn't the movement of capital uh, from individuals into small business in Canada like the United States. Labor markets are more rigid than the, than the United States. We are a more regulated environment. Uh, they're deregulating the United States. If you have to move in all these areas simultaneously before you get any kind of momentum and self-renewing dynamic taking place. What's your discussion going to be this afternoon with Premier Bennett? What have you got to say to him? Well, Premier Bennett is uh, interested in discussing our uh, submission to the federal government on the kind of policies that are appropriate uh, as we move into the 80s and as we uh, uh, find most jobs coming from brand new companies. He wants to hear and uh, discuss uh, uh, our uh, submission on uh, what are the appropriate initiatives that should be taken by the federal and provincial government. You want changes in the tax system? Well, the major problem, we just interviewed in the last six months 30,012 companies personally, and uh, but 55% said their number one problem is the total burden of taxation, and about 48% said their major problem was uh, the burden of red tape regulation paper burden. And the trouble is in this country, we give tokenism to small business. We have the provincial government will reduce taxes with the left hand and increase, pay, increase uh, uh, workers' compensation and, and property taxes by the same amount. And the federal government does the same thing. They take a billion dollars out of the equity base of small business through mm -hmm. hikes and UI premiums, and then they give them a billion dollars for the tax cuts. Mm -hmm. but, but the burden of taxation is growing all the time, and yet the, that sector is the only sector that's creating new jobs. Two quick final questions. Do you and Premier Bennett agree on that? And is anybody in Ottawa listening to you? I think that uh, this is no longer a philosophical question, that uh, uh, the fact that uh, the majority of the jobs in the next five years are going to come from firms that don't exist today uh, means that governments, regardless of their philosophy, can't central plan the economy anymore. Therefore, whether you're a, a, a left or a right government, a federal or provincial, you all have to move towards uh, creating initiatives that stimulate local activity, that uh, uh, encourage individuals to invest in small business, that uh, uh, encourage uh, uh, an entrepreneurial culture in our school system. Everybody has got the same pressures and problems, and every country in the world has, a, has the same economic changes mm -hmm. taking place. So it's not a question of Ottawa agreeing. The point is the federal government is philosophically moving towards a more decentralized economy. They're allowing initiatives to be done at the local level and the provincial level. This is good news for people in BC. It should be good news to everybody in Canada. And I'm encouraged that uh, our resources are going to be better directed because we're going to think like small business people and get things done at the local level rather than done by uh, Ottawa. Okay, Mr. Bullock, good to talk to you. Thank you. Nice to talk to you, Pamela. John Bullock, he's head of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business in the province of British Columbia to talk to the cabinet and the premier about the future of small business and how to make life a bit easier for small business people. We'll be back in just a moment to take a look at the very troubling issue of domestic violence, wife beating, what to do with the wife beaters. Let me share with you some pretty frightening statistics. Wife assault is responsible for one-fifth of all Canadian homicides. A conservative estimate suggests that 10% of Canadian women are beaten by their husbands, by their partners. He has an MA in psychology, he's a therapist, and he works with uh, men who beat their wives. It's a referral system. He tries to solve their problems, deals with the victims as well. He's joining us now. Good morning, Mr. Trimble. Good morning. 
Those statistics about right, is that how you see it? That's right. Mm -hmm. Those are conservative estimates. That's reasonable, and the estimates from the studies in the states are even much higher. So certainly that's, we can follow on that as being true. Is there any kind of system right now for figuring out why this happens? Do you know why? I guess that's the most common question I get. And my answer is there is not a simple answer. There may be as many answers as there are men who are doing it. There are some common characteristics we could talk about. One is that violence, by and large, works. Uh, the men, in many ways, uh, get control or reassert control in the relationship. The other thing is that violence has been sanctioned in our society. I don't know how many people know that the expression rule of thumb Mm -hmm. refers to English common law in which it stated that a man could strike his wife with something smaller in diameter than his thumb. Of course, meaning that it was legal. And of course, until and recently, we were considered the property of husbands. Exactly. So it's very much those kinds of things that have supported the continuation of wife assault in our society. I'm wondering why it is such a difficult problem. I guess one of the other most really common questions is why don't women walk away from it? Many women do, and I think that's the thing that's often missed, that uh, many women do leave, and many of the single uh, parents, many of the women out there with children have left violent relationships. Uh, that is not recognized as mm -hmm. often as it does occur. The other thing is that women don't leave for a variety of reasons. One is economic. It's very difficult to make it alone with two right. or three children if you don't have uh, training in any uh, career. The other thing is the real threats from the man saying, um, if you leave, I'll come after you and beat you up. I'll kill you. I'll take the children. And sometimes carrying through in that. And we notice, you know, in the last six months, there have been several instances of men carrying through in those threats mm -hmm. and police officers being injured or losing their lives attending those calls. So there's a, there's a fear inside the system to deal with it too because it's messy. That's right. All right. Your system, your approach to dealing mm -hmm. with this is to take men who beat their wives and sit them down in a session with other men who beat their wives and talk about it. That's right. Now an awful lot of other people would say lock them up and throw away the key. We're never going to build enough jails to lock them all up. One in ten? Are you kidding? That's not going to happen. So what are we going to do? One of the reasons the criminal justice system hasn't worked is there hasn't been any other uh, hopeful way for the people in the system, from police, through mm -hmm. Crown Counsel, through the judges, to deal with wife assault cases. Many of the men that we're dealing with, it's the first assault, the first time they've ever been charged. And so it's, it's new and the, the uh, judge is looking, if I send this man to jail for 10 or 30 days, um, is he going to learn not to be violent? and if he's the sole supporter of this family, what kind of impact is that going to have on the family? Traditionally, what we've been seeing is that the men have been getting probation, and that's about it. But probation in itself doesn't necessarily stop their violence at all. Just the fact of surveillance might make some men, whoa, I've got to watch out. But the fact is, by providing a treatment program, we're giving an option to everyone down through the system, from the police, the Crown, through the judges, and the men themselves and the women, hopefully, as they were coming mm -hmm. to be known by transition house workers, that you can do something different, that there is another alternative to just ignoring it or putting the man All in jail. All right, let me put it this way. If I was a guy in one of those situations and I had the choice between going to jail or going to sit down and, and talk about it uh, in a group, mm -hmm. I'd opt for the talking about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, uh, we're not on the other hand, an easy option, which I think is maybe the point you're making. Mm -hmm. Men who haven't attended our group um, have been breached for not attending. It's a term of their probation. It's on their probation order. And judges are treating that, s that seriously. I was uh, pleased to find that one man was breached and spent time in jail for not attending the for group. For not attending the meeting. That's what do you right. talk about when you get them there? The first thing is that they have to confront the violence that they are doing, that they have done very common characteristic to men who are aggressive is that they minimize. Well, I pushed her around a few times, but she wasn't really hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't mean to do it. We've had a really good talk. I know it won't happen again. Um, I was drunk at the time. I've had an alcohol problem, but now I'm going to AA, so I don't have a problem again. So men have many kinds of excuses for right. not dealing with their violence. So the first thing is to get them to look at how how often they are violent. We don't just look at physical violence, we look at psychological abuse as well. Because it's often those things in our contact with the victims. They, I've had more than once a woman say to me, you know, the, the bruises have healed, but what he said to me still rings in my ears, and that's what was difficult for me to get over. So you make them sit there with other guys, other mm -hmm. men who beat their wives, and what do they do? Do they share stories? Yes, at the beginning, that's the first important thing is we ask each of the men to talk 
about what brought them, brought them to our program, what they've done, and uh, what they would also what they would like to get from the group. A lot of the group, some of the men refer to it as a class. Mm -hmm. um, after two or three sessions out of 16 that they're required to attend on a weekly basis, they're expected to bring homework, which is an anger diary. It's a specific way of writing down the times they're angry and analyzing it with the goal of getting more control over what they do. All right, I'm interested in, and this is for our viewers too, so mm -hmm. they can figure out how this system works. How come some men end up going to jail and some men end up coming to talk to you? Who decides that? Well, that would be the judge in cooperation with the Crown Council and possibly the probation officer as well. We also interview men um, and we don't re accept every man that's referred to us. We can't help every person. You can't the, take the hardcore cases. Exactly. If they're too dangerous, the fact is we're only seeing them once a week. They're not in jail while they're with us. If their partner's at a high risk, um, and we feel that that man isn't going to contain his behavior, the, the threat of going back to jail mm -hmm. by not attending our group, we're not going to accept him. We also don't accept men who are currently before the court, as we're concerned that the man might argue and say, listen, I'm, uh, I'm going to go to this group with Dale Trimble. Why don't you drop the charges? Right. Um, and then not show up well, for Well, that's what I'm asking in a sense. I mean, uh, this is a good con in a lot of ways. If they, uh, if they give you the right mm -hmm. signals in the meeting with you, then they can get off coming and just talking and, and mm -hmm. having a little chat with you and promising to be good in the future. Yeah, that's a risk. We think it's a risk that's uh, worthwhile taking and um, we also are very confrontative all the way through the program. We're currently doing a survey of all the men that have completed the group in the last mm -hmm. year. And, I, you know, I have to say that some of those men, I don't feel that we made a very big impact on, but when I talk to them and talk to their partners, what I very often heard was that the group did make a difference. That even though so at his, least they're talking about yes, it. yeah, and that men learn to take a time out to leave rather than to be violent, and that they gain a great deal from being in a group with other men. All right, we'll be back in just a moment to continue our conversation with Dale Trimble. He's a man who deals with men who beat their wives. A serious problem. Four to five thousand women in the Lower Mainland alone are beaten. Your calls in just a moment. <laughs> The topic this morning on the Webster Show is wife beating. One in ten Canadian women are beaten by their husbands or partners. It's a serious situation. Our guest this morning is Dale Trimble. He runs a program to deal with men who beat their wives. Mr. Trimble, you were saying some interesting things when we were talking just a few moments ago about this whole system. I want to ask you pretty directly, pretty up front, whether or not bringing these men who beat their wives together in a little encounter session to talk is really going to solve the problem. Do you really stop wife beating? Sometimes I think we do. Uh, there is there's not yet, to our knowledge, and this includes the Jim Browning who did a report of groups across Canada, 30 of mm -hmm. them, been a, a qualified research evaluation of how well the programs work. That involves right. control groups and all of that. We're just completing our survey of the men that have completed the group in the last year. Of the 31 who uh, entered and completed the program, 13 are still with their partners and so far seven of those the men have that we've contacted there has been no further violence and that's confirmed by the partner. Do you encourage reconciliation? No we don't. The primary goal of our group is to stop the violence. Uh, we're not involved in trying to get the, the marriage back together necessarily. And sometimes stopping the violence means ending the marriage. Yeah very often we encourage the partners to separate. We can't always implement that and that's mm -hmm. really up to them. And we really feel that it's uh, dangerous often to do couples counseling at the outset because that implicitly and sometimes explicitly blames the woman who is really the victim. And we think that unless we say directly to the man, you're responsible for the violence, violence is a crime, right. you've been convicted of that, we have to deliver that message. When we start talking about a communication problem, then that allows the man who is already saying things like I mentioned earlier, well, it's because she bitches at me. If she wouldn't nag me, I wouldn't fly off the I hand. want to ask you a little bit about that. What causes these men to beat their wives? Is, is it a question of, of violence? They are just aggressive people? Is it sexual domination they want? What's, what are the kinds of things that motivate these people? A majority of them have been abused as children. Mm -hmm. uh, either witnessed their father beating up their mother or were physically abused by one or both parents. Right. By and large what they learn from that is that violence is a way to solve problems mm -hmm. and when you're upset or frustrated you resort to violence. Um, 
we believe by and large that men learn to be violent, they can learn not to be violent. Right. So that's a primary cause of the violence. And then all along the way that's reinforced by the societal things that we talked about earlier and the fact that, that people think that uh, nothing happens to men who assault their wives. Fortunately, we now have a new policy paper uh, with the Attorney General in mm -hmm. D.C. saying that, that wife assault is a crime and that police officers will arrest and when they have grounds to believe an assault has occurred, even if they haven't witnessed it. That has shown a 33 percent increase in uh, convictions of men just in one court in Vancouver in re reference to wife assault. All right, our guest is Dale Trimble. He runs a program for men who beat their wives. We're going to go to our phones now and hear from our viewers. Go ahead, please. I think my question actually started to be answered by Dale Trimble. Mm -hmm. My concern is that we don't have wife abuse or husband abuse or spousal abuse or child abuse or granny bashing. What we have is a family violence system or cycle. And I would like to know, has any work been done or has Dale thought of any work being done to look at the whole family system to identify the all the people who are violent within the system and all the people who are victims and done any research or any work to deal with the whole family violence system. All right. Uh, the caller seems to be saying that it's more than just husbands and wives that beat up on each other. It involves a lot of members of the family. Do you have to look at it in that larger picture? Yes. One thing is that I like to say to the callers that we always interview the woman when she's coming into our program. Mm -hmm. And there are some programs that I think provide an excellent model in Canada, and those are programs that integrate service to the children as well as to the victims, to the women, and assessing what kind of violence they've put up with assessing the kind of sexual abuse that may have occurred either at the hands of the man who has been physically violent or by another family member or someone outside of the family. So I really agree that we need to look at the whole issue. Yeah. And currently in Vancouver we're initiating more uh, liaison with those women that are providing treatment for the victims through transition houses. But your program is really for men exactly. who beat their wives. That's yeah. what your program is focused mm -hmm. on. All right, let's take another call. Go ahead, please. Hello, Dr. Trimble. Good morning. My question, uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, I haven't heard it yet, or an answer to it, but basically I, I like to think I'm a pretty level-headed guy and uh, I don't beat my wife and I never have, but there are some times when, uh, when she uh, says things to me and about me and uh, that really, if, if, if that had been another guy standing there saying those things to me, I, I'd certainly think about taking a swing at them. I probably wouldn't think twice about it. And I was just wondering what proportion of the men that come to see you have that uh, that that kind of, uh, of inclination to beat their wife, that they're basically bitched into it. All right, let's hear your comments on that, Mr. Trimble. The, the women are driving the men to it. I guess I basically don't agree with that point of view. The, uh, the fact is that what we say to the men, if a man was saying that to me in the group, we come back with, what could you have done? Mm -hmm. What could you have said? That there's always another choice. You can always blame another person for your behavior but the buck stops here. The person has to be held responsible. So you find that's really common when you get these men together in a group, is the comments that we just heard from our caller. She was driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yes. All right, we have more calls. Go ahead, another point, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I was a battered wife, and I have two children, and I finally had to make the decision to leave my husband. As, although it's not been easy, it's been really horrible, but it's been worth it. I came from a violent situation myself, and so did my husband. And when my son, who's now seven, finally witnessed a domestic violence situation, that's when I had to decide to leave because I didn't want him to have that kind of a life too and accept that like I did. And my concern is how to, um, how do I, what do I teach him? How do, how do I explain it to him? I think you've already done a lot of teaching by just by leaving and saying you're delivering a message to your son, um, I don't deserve to be hit, I don't have to stand for that and I can be different. I think that's one of the most important messages you can deliver and, and saying also that it's not right for for people to be hit. It's against the law and I will protect you from that. Delivering that message is very important. The topic is domestic violence, wife beating and what to do with the men who beat their wives. We'll be back in just a moment. We'll hear from you. Our phones are ringing. Please keep calling. Wow. 
one in ten Canadian women is beaten by their husband or the man that they live with. It is a frightening statistic. Our guest this morning, Dale. One in every ten Canadian women are beaten by their husbands or the man that they live with. Dale Trimble is with us this morning. He's a therapist. He runs a program for men who beat their wives. Mr. Trimble, I want to ask you one more time on this question. You run this program. Men come and have 16 sessions, sit around and pour their heart out. Are you sure they shouldn't be in jail? Some of them uh, who don't attend the program, we ask that uh, they be returned to the court and mm -hmm. often sent to jail. But we've assessed them prior to their coming into the program and, and we've determined that we feel we have a reasonable possibility of changing this man's behavior. And we look at a number of things. If he has a long history of, of assault, then we're real concerned. If there's an alcohol problem he doesn't yet have under control, mm -hmm. uh, he needs to get alcohol treatment at the same time. If there's a severe mental illness, then we need to refer him to a other treatment facility rather than our own. How tough can you be on them? Pretty tough and some, some men I think would uh, have even said I'd rather have gone to jail than have to come to this initially. It's not an easy program. We're pushing them a lot and one of the men I just talked to a few days ago mm -hmm. who felt that he got a lot from, from it, what he said is he, he got pushed. He got pushed to confront why he was not leaving rather than hitting his wife. All right, let's take a call now from Chilliwack. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, I uh, have been a bystander a number of times when uh, there was a partner beating going on. And uh, usually I could not sympathize with either party. Uh, both the man, and, the man and the woman were quite rough people or, and often very heavy drinkers. Uh, my question brings up a theme that was brought up before. What is being done for the women, that is, the women who do contribute to the problem, which I have seen, as I said, and what about the women who beat their husbands? I've known some of those, too. All right, that raises a couple of different questions, Mr. Trimble. Do you bring the women into these ses sessions that you have with the husbands or not? We don't bring the women into the sessions. We feel that uh, they often need separate counseling um, to mm -hmm. help deal with having been a victim. Mm -hmm. And although what the caller is mentioning is uh, mutual kind of abuse. We're always asking about that, how the woman handles her right. own feelings of anger. Um, because uh, she might be resorting with violence herself and right. although though some people have said, well, um, I, my husband used to hit me and then I hit him over the head with a frying pan and he stopped it. Well, some cases that may happen, but very often it results in a more serious assault. So we, I have concern about the women who are being violent right. as well, but that I really have found to be a minority. And um, I guess over, I've dealt with probably over 100, 150 men in the last seven years now in doing this work. I've dealt with three or four battered husbands. And uh, so just a smaller it's problem. very small in All relation right. to what's going on. Another call, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to know, uh, statistically, looking at the whole subject, uh, the background of these people, are some of them more from the same background than others, unemployed or welfare, or, people from, from that type of background. All right, we've touched on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, what kind of men beat their wives? Every kind of man. I've worked with certainly many unemployed, but also um, professionals, doctors, lawyers, uh, RCMP officer. Um, the fact is that in the court system, what we get is a lot of people who tend to be unemployed. Those are the, those are the ones who are coming through the court who don't have an expensive lawyer to defend their case. Um, but it's not an indication of the wide rangeness of the problem. It's those that have more money, excuse me, that can hide it behind closed doors. All right, there's that, but there's also the, the difference, and I guess in a sense it's a class question. If you happen to be a fairly well-educated uh, businessman who's very articulate, maybe you could get away in this group of yours where you could sit and come and talk, as opposed to someone who might not be so comfortable with the language and expressing feelings. Well, um, maybe you could get away, but we, we push all the men to face that. And many times what you get is some of the men pushing that mm -hmm. well-to-do man as well. Actually, some of the most severe violence I've heard about is at the hands of men who were very well-to-do, mm -hmm. um, destroying their whole house, nearly strangling their wife. And yet this man had a very respected job, was respected and well-liked in the community. That's one of the difficult things for the women often is that everyone else says, you have such a marvelous husband. Right. He's so active in the community. He really he cares about the kids. he could probably talk a pretty good game, game exactly. when he came to your meeting. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take another call here. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, there's just one, uh, one old saying that I, that I remember coming across some time ago, and that is that a man sees himself in, uh, in reflection of his woman's eyes. 
that being that if, uh, if the woman uh, reacts to her man in a negative way in the form of put downs and whatnot, he sees himself uh, in a very bad light and he doesn't like himself. And it's always with that in mind that uh, when I hear this question of wife beating, I wonder uh, as to what extent the woman has played in this because normally outside the home, this is probably a nonviolent man. And uh, I, it, it, that is, I'm a single man, I'm 33 years old, and I've seen this situation around me. I've, uh, I've had people confide in me about these situations. And a lot of these men, it's just a feeling of loss, of inability to handle some of the things that their woman is, uh, is doing to them. All right, let me interrupt. We've had that from almost every caller that's called in this morning. Somehow the woman is to blame. She drove me mm -hmm. to it. She mm -hmm. ruined my self-image. What do you say to that? Assault's a crime. If you hit someone, that is assault, and you're responsible to, to that. The fact is, we have other choices. The men are saying um, very often by the end of the program, I realize that I do have to take responsibility for it in order. I have to stop blaming her, and I can do something else. They start to realize that they have control in themselves rather than saying, see, if you say that she forced me to do it, you're saying she controls me. Mm -hmm. And um, that process, and the caller's referring to that in a way, um, person is feeling out of control, they're not in control of themselves anymore. And if you follow that reasoning, then one of the ways of reasserting that control is to strike out physically. Good of you to join us this morning, talk about this uh, interesting, if not troubling issue. Mm -hmm. Our Thank guest has been Dale Trimble. He is a master's in psychology, is a therapist. He runs a program to help men deal with the problem of beating their wives. One in 10 Canadian women are beaten by their partners. We'll be back in just a moment. This has been the Webster Show. I'm Pamela Wall, and I enjoyed my day sitting in here in Jack's chair talking to all of you in beautiful British Columbia. Hope to see you soon. Tomorrow on the program, the host will be Rick Honey. We're talking about lots of uh, awards. The Grammy Awards are on tonight, so Bruce Allen, a rock promoter, will be in to take a look at some local homegrown talent. Madam Russ Reed, who runs a brothel, will also be in. So stay tuned for the Webster Show tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. precisely. What's happening inside the Kremlin tonight on Czech TV at midnight? What's happening inside the Kremlin tonight on Czech at midnight? <laughs>